you know, the Federal Reserve's got a meeting coming up very shortly. The one thing when, you know, we talk about liquidity, their financial conditions or market liquidity, that is inflationary in nature. And, and this is going to be a concern for the Fed. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm the founder and your host, Adam Taggart, welcoming you here at the end of another week, um, a week that caps a pretty good month uh, for the markets for the month of November. I'm joined as usual by my emotionally sensitive friend, Lance Roberts, who apparently just discovered that people can be mean on Twitter. How you doing, Lance? I'm good. And I'm never going to use to calling it X. So it's just going to remain Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just, I just, X just does not come off the tongue easily. No, it doesn't. It seems like it would, considering it's just one letter. But I know you would think so, but yeah, for some reason it's just uh, I don't know. Twitter, Twitter already won the brand, you know, war there, and uh, I don't know why he's trying to remove a brand that we can't stop saying. But anyways, right. his prerogative, but our prerogative to still say Twitter. Um, all right. Well, as I mentioned, Lance, um, you know, a, a mildly up week for the markets this week, but closing out November. Pretty amazing month for the markets. If I've got my uh, my data correct here, uh, global bond and stocks added over 11 trillion in market cap this month, the second biggest monthly gain in history. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, let's see, global the, bonds. The, the, only, the only time it was a bigger gain in November was in uh, November 2020. Um, just, you know, we were getting the stimulus checks and all that was starting to hit the markets and the Fed was doing 1.2 trillion a month and or one, uh, 120 billion a month in QE. And then, of course, we launched off into 2021, which was just a nonstop up year for the markets. Well, so, yes. Yeah, so the best month since back then when the Fed was just doing a gargantuan, completely historically unprecedented amount of liquidity. Right. Um, I am going to get to some data in a little bit about liquidity, which may be contributing somewhat to this surge, um, although it looks like the impulse for that liquidity is now ending. And we can talk about that in a bit. But let me just mention, too, that not only did um, the entire market do really well, but the bond market did especially well. It had its best month since December globally, since December 2008. And for the U.S., U.S. bonds soared to their best month since May 1985. So I want to... I want to give you a chance here, Lance, to take a bit of a victory lap. I was kind of kind of holding you back the last time we talked, but um, <laughs> uh, you know, you were out there telling folks, "Look, I'm still I'm still in uh, the bond trade here. I'm still holding on to most of my TLTs. In fact, you were buying a bunch more for your personal account over the past couple of months. Um, obviously, that has worked out pretty well in the short term here, at least. Yeah, and and again, so you know, just to backtrack a bit, you know. We actually sold TLT previously, bought EDB because we wanted to extend our duration. So we did a tax loss sell back in October, swapped our duration out longer uh, in EDB. And uh, as I noted, I had overweighted that position a bit. And so uh, probably about mid-November-ish, I guess, I have to go back and look at the exact date. I took a little piece of that trading position off, but still hold the long position because the upside is, I mean, you take a look at a long-term chart of interest rates, you can't even see this recent move down, which we got below 4.3% on yields uh, this week. Um, you know, we're kind of flipping back and forth here a little bit, but, you know, yields are very overbought here. So if you're long the bond trade, take some profits here, you're going to get a tick up in rates. Uh, we're going to go from overbought on bonds to over, you know, back to oversold on bonds, just like the market does. So you have, and if you haven't, and if you haven't put on a trade yet, and you're looking for an opportunity, don't do so. You're going to get a better opportunity, and I suspect. And I guess we'll talk about this some more uh, when you talk about liquidity. But um, you know, the Federal Reserve's got a meeting coming up very shortly. The one thing when you know we talk about liquidity, their financial conditions or market liquidity, that is inflationary in nature, and and this is going to be a concern for the Fed. The one thing that Jerome Powell noted at the last FOMC meeting was that. The bond market and the stock market, because of October, yields were rising sharply. We were at 5%. Stock market was down sharply. People were convinced the, you know, the bear market was back. And you know, the, the, we're getting the most bearish narratives out of people. And you know, bears were running around claiming victory laps in October. And we warned you then that you know, that extreme bearishness was going to reverse. 
And but the problem with that reversal is that it loosens monetary conditions, which gives people and we saw this recently. We saw an uptick in consumer confidence. If consumers become more confident, they go out and they spend money. And this is exactly what Ben Bernanke said back in 2010 when he did in September, when he did the second round of quantitative easing. He said the reason we're doing QE is to lift asset prices in order to boost consumer confidence, which will then feed into economic growth. So for, right. if anybody ever tells you that QE does not boost asset markets, just quote Ben Bernanke to them because that's so. exactly what they do. It. And that's the whole wealth effect, I mean, in practice, right? right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so my, my concern now, short term, is, and, and I'm actually kind of rooting for this, is I want the Fed to come out and be a bit more hawkish. Um, you know, everybody's expecting the Fed to not only pause at this next meeting on I think it's December 13th. Don't quote me the on, on don't quote me on the date. I think it, it's mid-month, but I think it's the 13th. And to be clear, to remain paused, but yes. Yeah. And they're gonna and yeah, everybody's wanting to make a statement like, uh, you know, everything's fine and you know, we don't need to do anymore, kind of in that language. Yeah. And I don't think the Fed I, I, A, I don't think the Fed's gonna do that. And I'm kind of hoping they don't. I hope they come out and say, you know, we're still concerned about inflation. We still have one rate hike left on the table, kind of in our back pocket if we need to use it to pull some of this froth back out of the market a bit because the markets are getting too far ahead of themselves relative to what the Fed's actually going to do. So we need a little bit of a breather here to work off some of these overbought conditions. That'll give you a better entry point to either buy bonds or buy stocks as well. Okay. Um, so uh, the Fed, I, I just want to go back to something you said a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I want to make sure that you still believe the Fed isn't actually going to hike again. But it's going to have this sort of like, don't make me turn this car around, you know, Correct. message to the market. Like, don't, don't, don't make me do this next rate hike, which I'm just about to do if you keep this up, right? Exactly. Well, you know, and look, and that's that's exactly what we saw in all of 2022. Um, you'll remember this because we had this conversation repeatedly uh, in 2022. The market would sell off and then we and, and then the market would start to rally on expectations the fed was going to turn around and start cutting rates or or do something and then the fed would and then so the market would rally up sharply and then the fed would come out of meetings say nope we're still fighting inflation then the market would sell off again and then it would rally back up and and it would get to a point the fed would come out and say no God, we're not going to cut rates anytime soon and then we'd sell off again and that was that repeated process all through 2022 and you know, the, and, and what the markets keep doing is working against what the Fed's trying to achieve. The Fed wants lower market values. They want higher interest rates near term to slow consumer spending, so they can bring down inflation, get inflation back under control. They want it below two, you know, two percent or less. And the markets keep doing exactly the opposite of what the Fed wants, which is unfortunately going to have to, you know, and look, just my opinion, and I could be entirely wrong about this. But I have to assume if I'm Jerome Powell that the, the 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 rather sharp drop in interest rates, which we've already seen mortgage rates coming down, we've already seen an uptick in consumer confidence, we're seeing an uptick in economic data, you know, leading in, in the the year the six month rate of change and leading economic indicators have turned up. You know, you're starting to see this flow back into the markets in just a very short period, and that's got to be concerning to the Fed, who is worried about a resurgence of inflation. Uh, going into next year. All right. Um, what's so interesting because that's been the that has been the dynamic for the entire year, um, where the Fed has said I'm going to be higher for longer, and the market has said I don't believe you're going to be, and and then it's moved stocks up, and then the Fed has come back and said no, 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 I'm going to do it, and the market has had to change its expectations, but it hasn't mattered. For right. the price of the indices, right? And of course, that's the basically the mag seven, you know, pulling everything up. Um, but if you're just looking at the indices, it's been so interesting that the market has been wrong every time about the Fed's timing for a pivot, and yet it hasn't mattered to stocks. Um, obviously, the big question is, will it at some point? We'll get there. I do, though, um, and, and that's why I'm talking here. Maybe if you can pull up your your weekly chart of the S and P here, because I, I want to get into some of that data in, in a sec. Um, but again, in addition to giving you a bit of a victory lap on TLT, I want to continue to give one to you on uh, your call, uh, you know, a month ago that, hey, I, I think that stocks are going to more than likely than not end the year higher, maybe even at an all-time high for the year. And um, 
the the rally has continued. You know, this week it's it's somewhat plateaued, even though we are a bit higher than we were when we started the week. First question for you is: Is your call still for a short-term pullback in the market because of its current overbought conditions? And then about um, you know sometime in mid December into the end of the year. Um, well, so uh, as you can see on this chart that you know I'm sharing with you now, there's three blue arrows that point down, not up. Yep. So, so kind of <laughs> answers to my question right there visually. Thank you. Yeah, but but you know the important thing here is, and, and again, look, you know, I'm this isn't saying that a bear market's, and, and this is always interesting because you know I do a weekly thing with uh, Fox Business News uh, with Charles Payne, and it's always very because he's always very bullish. And if I say anything about a short-term correction or a consolidation, he's like, well, you're bearish on stocks. You know, I thought you liked stocks. Why are you bearish? And I'm like, no, I'm not bearish. It's just that things can't move up indefinitely. You've got right. to have these pullbacks along the way. And, you know, we've used the rubber band analogy before, and it's just a great analogy of this. If I stretch a rubber band, you know, there's a point I can't stretch it any further. Either the rubber band's going to break or I'm just not strong enough to stretch it any further. So in order to stretch it again, I've got to relax it and then stretch it, right? So the markets work exactly the same way. When markets rally, we exhaust the buyers. Everybody that was wanting to buy at the bottom of October is now bought. Sellers who were all willing to sell in October no longer want to sell. They're like, hey, the market's going up. I don't want to sell here. The market's going to keep going up. So why would I want to sell? So you simply just run out of buyers and sellers at a point. And then what happens is that markets start to kind of work themselves around a bit and the sellers go, well, maybe we're not going to go up any further or there's a piece of news or whatever it is. And somebody says, OK, I'll sell here. And then that starts the whole process to the downside. So you get this kind of correctional process. But if we look at that, if we look at a chart of the market, first of all, this bottom this bottom graph is a, just a basic relative strength index. All it just kind of just tells you, is, you know, what the market's doing. And we're back to levels that historically have coincided with at least a short-term market peak, if not a bigger peak. You know, last time we were kind of this overbought was, you know, June, July. And this is where we were talking about in June, July. We said, hey, be ready. We're probably going to get a 5 to 10% correction this summer because we've had such a big run-up in the markets and we're so overbought here. You're going to get a 5 to 10% correction. Well, that decline from the peak of the market to the October lows was 10.3%. So it was right in that 10% range of that normal annual decline. And of course, and, and I, as I told you back then, I said, Adam, when this decline occurs, everybody's going to be super bearish. Everybody's going to be convinced the bear market's back and we're going to have super negative sentiment and the economy's falling apart and a recession's right around the corner. That's not going to be the case. It's just correcting this major run that we had going from February to July. So you know, that was all very part of a normal correctional process. Well, here we are again, very overbought. So if we just use a Fibonacci retracement sequence of the rally, um, you know, a pullback to, you know, uh, the 23.6% retracement, it'll put you right back at the bottom of that gap up that we had, you know, in, in, in mid-November, that kind of really, where this rally really just kind of got a life of its own. Um, but gap ups, and if you talk to Sven Heinrich about this, he'll tell you this as well. Gaps are like gravity and they want to be filled. And so, so gaps tend to act, I should say gravity, more like a magnet. And, and so they want to pull prices through that gap up that normally occurs. And so that'd be a 38% retracement of that rally. That put us right back around 4,400 still. That, and that would be great, right? we uh, we get back to a level that would have the markets back to oversold conditions. You'd be sitting at you know that that uh, previous gap breakout, right? So we filled that gap, and now we're we're in a good position. And about that time that we get to 4,400, the 50-day moving average is going to be sitting right at that level. Mm -hmm. um, so so you'll have the the 50-day moving average support right around 4,400 when we get there. Now you know a 50% retracement of a rally is completely normal. And so you should expect that as well. If we get some really hawkish news from the Fed, a 50% retracement of the rally would certainly not be, you know, out of the realm of ordinary. That would give you a really good opportunity. Markets are going to be pretty deeply oversold at that point. Um, and you're going to have a good opportunity to basically put some money to work for that traditional kind of year end Santa Claus rally, first five days of January, um, as pension funds, mutual funds, et cetera, all put their money back on, in, into the markets. 
So again, that's kind of gives you some ranges to work with. I have no idea, you know, what will actually turn out to be the case. We'll just have to navigate that because a lot of it will depend on what kind of news flow do we get? What kind of economic data do we get? What is the, but mostly what the Fed says? Um, the employment report will have a lot to do with that. If we have a really strong employment report, that's going to pull the market down. If we have a strong inflationary report for some reason, don't really see it right now. The data doesn't support it. But if we happen to have a pop up in CPI, that could pull the data down. Again, a strong, you know, more hawkish message from the Fed could certainly do the trick. So the risk there is a correction. There is another solution to this, which is that the market just does nothing for the next three weeks. And that's just, what I was going to ask. And just goes sideways for three weeks um, and works off some. And, and again, what you're looking for is just a reversal of this RSI index. You're just looking for that some of that overbought condition to get reversed. And the market just going sideways can do exactly that same thing. So a correction sideways action, you know, likely, you know, uh, you know, the most likely outcome here. I doubt we see this kind of rally just continue higher. We haven't gone anywhere basically in the market for the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine trading days. We've just kind of been going sideways for over a week now. So again, that's just kind of what the market does when it does this. Volume has been declining on this rally. Um, if I'm long equities right now, um, in the last month of December, this is a great time to do tax loss harvesting. Sell your losers, uh, take them off the table. In 31 days, you can buy them back. Um, take profits and stuff that has had, that's really overbought, that's had a big run up. It's a great time to take some of those capital gains, offset them against your losses, kind of you know manage some of your tax risk that way as well. Uh, that's what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks. We just finished up the, the last of our tax loss harvesting today in our ETF model. Um, so you know this is a great time to take advantage of this rally to rebalance risk in your portfolio and get yourself prepared for next year. Okay. A couple of questions related to what you just said real quick, mm -hmm. um, because you talked about gaps getting filled. You know, you were looking there at the 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 38 percent retracement that the Fibonacci series could happen. There's that gap there. Right. Right. But then there's some gaps further down, um, like around, you know, 4325 and then in the mid 4200s. Yep. Do you do you think those like what's what's the risk of those pulling, you know, the magnet down to fill those? You, you, it, it's certainly possible. Look, you know, markets, you, you know, uh, back in July, nobody thought the market was going to correct 10%, right? Um, you know, so there's certainly a possibility, but you're going to need some type of, you know, catalyst to yep. make that occur. Because what you've got to do is now you've got to break this bullish sentiment that we've got going on in the market. So the markets are not, we are getting more of the greed factor back into the market. If you take a look at professional sentiment, take a look at retail investor sentiment, it's getting very bullish, but it's not extremely bullish yet. So there's still some, some room left to get everybody into the pool, so to speak. Um, so that's why there's a, a bit more support to the markets. Also, you just have the seasonal you know, biases of the markets right now, the, the portfolio window dressing for year end, the first five days of January, which is where everybody's got to put their money to work for the year. So there's some biases that are going to support the markets near term. However, if you get some type of really, really bad, you know, economic, you know, we're through earnings right now, too. So we don't have any earnings to deal with um, until we get into uh, to January. So there's really nothing here to drag the market substantially down unless the Fed comes out and shock the market and actually hike rates on the 13th. Got that it, would yes. that yeah. would probably do the trick. So they're probably, yeah, some some unexpected catalyst like that. I yeah. guess, too, technically, uh, you would have, you know, you, you th th as the market begins to go down and try to close those gaps, it, it hits the daily, it hits the moving averages and those begin to act as resistance, too, right? Support. Yeah, they do. Yeah, I'm sorry. Resistance to, to going down further or support, right. i.e. support. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so two things. Um, let's let's stop the sharing here. But um, I want to give you. Fine, a chance. I'm not going to share with you anymore. Yeah, no, 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 no. Because <laughs> I want you to. Um, so uh, it, it, you know, as you said, uh, if the market just kind of grinds sideways, that's actually net bullish, right? right. Because it it takes the the pressure off the overbought readings as as more time goes on there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, you know, I still believe and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm still believe your base case is that we are going to see the market go down because of the, the still overbought nature of things before it probably powers into the end of the year. You recently wrote 
an article called Stock Market Correction Coming Before the Santa Claus Rally. And you have a couple of charts in there. And I'm just curious, do you want to go through any of those here while we're talking about this topic? Oh. Sure. I mean, we can. I mean, it's it's. let me pull that article up here real quick. Um, it, it's it's pretty much the same thing that we just kind of discussed, um, you know, but just the reality is, is that markets, you know, it is possible for the market to just consolidate sideways. And that's that that is something that, that can happen. Um, it's not usually the case. Normally, markets go through a correctional pullback of some sort. Um, let me, okay, I've got this up here. Let me uh, do one thing and then I'll share my screen. And there's a couple of reasons for kind of talking about this, this kind of pullback scenario. And oh, where'd you go? There you go. Um, so this is just this is a, a chart from EquityClock.com. It's just a, a seasonality chart of the markets and kind of what happens from month to month. It's just an average of all years. And what you'll notice is is that in, in early December you typically have a little spike up in the market. And then what we what we were talking about specifically in that article is you have all your mutual fund distributions. Those tend to occur in the first couple of first two to three weeks of December. Uh, particularly the second week and third week of December, you typically get these distributions. So you normally have this bit of a pullback in the market, not uncommon at all. That's what we're talking about here is just when that selling hits the market, because these mutual funds have to distribute capital gains, dividends and interest for the year. Um, that's going to be some selling pressure for the market. And that that's what gives you that bit of a pullback. Once that's over, then they have to turn around and start buying again to get their portfolios dressed for the end of the year reporting, right? They can't be holding too much cash. They've got to have all the right positions. And that's why you get that, that last little, that traditional Santa Claus rally. It's because of that window dressing that, that tends to occur. Um, hey, and as you're moving up from that chart, I just want to give Sven Henrik a quick shout out because when I had him on several months ago, he pulled up that chart and just said, hey, look, I'm not saying this is how the year is going to end. But he said, so far in 2023, the arc of, of, the indices has pretty much been spot on with this annual seasonality chart. And it does still, now that we're here on the last inning or so, it still seems to be playing out this way. So for yeah. whatever reason, this year has been very, very typical from a seasonality standpoint. Yeah, I know. If, if you take a full year look at the S&P 500, it looks very much like this chart. And, and you see, you know, here was the peak in June. You know, we peaked in July. This one peaks in June. Then you have your sell-off into October, mar market bottoms in October, we bottomed late October. And then you had this rally that started in November. And so, so again, yeah, I mean, it, it, this is your rally at the beginning of the year, February, March, April, May, June, the market was up 17%. So, you know, you this the, 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 the arc, as you said, of the market this year, very, and here it is again, I mean, you can see it right here. Here's that same arc of performance that you've had all year long. So you get a bit of a pullback here. And again, this is where I was noting, you know, volume's been drying up while markets have been advancing. That's a negative divergence. And that's just that buyers are running out of buying power and they're, you know, sellers are going and if buyers are running out of buying power and they bought all they want to buy and the mutual funds have to distribute as an example, that's that additional selling pressure that the market can't absorb. And that's why you get that bit of a correction uh, in the short term. So, you know, again, it's just, you know, and this is where we looked at, you know, areas where volume exists and where buyers are most likely going to show up. And, and this is what I was talking about, that, that gap where that we have in the market and why that will probably act like a magnet if we get some type of correction, because there's not a lot of buyers that were in that gap. They all existed right around the 50-day moving average. So that was where the big bulk of your buy, your buyers was. There's a bit of buying here at this previous support. Now, this, this chart's a little bit dated. This was Friday of last week. Um, we've had a little bit more action since then, but... There's some there's some some buying volume that exists right here around 449 ish on on SPY as an example, but below that it's mostly around that 50 day moving average. So that's why I'm saying that 50 day moving average around 4400 seems to be a pretty likely target if we get into a, a more substantial ish type correction. And again, just kind of going through the technicals. Whenever the market has been this overbought, you know, you've got your MACD overbought, you've got statistics overbought, you've got your RSI is very overbought. You've almost always had some type of corrective action that followed 
it's just kind of, a, but it can take time. It doesn't mean, and, and just because it doesn't happen today or tomorrow, next week, doesn't mean it won't. And back in, remember, back in June, July, we were saying, hey, expect a 5 to 10% correction. It took about a month before the correction started. And everybody's like, oh, Lance is wrong. There's not going to be a correction. Then you had 10% correction, you know, August, September, October. It's just, it's this, this, it's prognosticating. It's not predicting. It's just saying, look, this is what happens when you stretch the rubber band. It's got to contract in some manner. Stock prices just don't go up in that indefinitely. And they don't, and remember in October, everybody was convinced the stock prices were only going to go down. They don't do that. That's not the way markets work. So the best thing you can do as an investor is learn the rhythm of the market so that you can navigate these ebbs and flows and you'll wind up buying high and selling low. All right. So let's let, let's let's assume for a second that you're going to be correct and that there is going to be an end of your buying surge as all the big funds rebalance and window dress and all that stuff, right? Sure. Does that imply then the longer it takes for this correction, the short-term correction to show up? Um, does that mean the longer it takes to show up, it's going to be more short and violent when it happens? Because it, it, if it's going to happen before that that surge, you know, you're running out of time to get the froth out of the market. Well, that's where this gets a little bit interesting, because first of all, let me just back up. There is absolutely no guarantee that we'll get a Santa Claus rally this year. Right. There are years that it doesn't happen. 2018 is a really good example. We did not get a Santa Claus rally in 2018. In fact, the markets were down 20% between September and December. Now, there was stuff going on there with the Federal Reserve and the Fed was, you know, back then the Fed was saying, hey, we're nowhere near the neutral rate. Markets are going down because the markets are freaking out that the Fed's going to keep hiking rates. And, you know, this is all coming to a very quick end. So there's no so first of all there's no guarantee that it'll go up. All we're saying is that the historical odds are that you're going to have this year in buying occur but not before you have some type of correction because that's what markets normally do. Again, normally being the key word doesn't mean it has to happen. So don't take this to the bank saying, "Oh, well Lance said this and you know, he's either going to be right or wrong." I'm just saying, that, look, statistically speaking, we have to play possibilities and probabilities. The probabilities are Correction first of some sort, consolidation correction, and then a rally in the year end. We may wind up exactly where we are right now. You know, after a correction, the market rallies, we have the Santa Claus rally, and we're right back to where we are right now. And that's because we had such a big rally in November. If you go back through history, whenever you've had these big 8, 9, 10% November months, which have occurred previously, December isn't that strong of a rally. Why? Because you've already pulled in all that buying into the market. So you may be, and I'm not saying do this, but you could theoretically probably sell here everything and then buy January the 1st, and you're going to be right where it'll be the same outcome potentially. Okay. So may, may be a good time to do your tax loss selling because yes. if there's not going to be that much of a, of a lift this year, sell now avoid whatever potential short-term correction might be coming. And by the time the new year gets here, you're able to buy back into everything without the wash rule. Correct. Absolutely right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, look, um, you know, I, I asked uh, folks on Twitter for questions that they might want to toss into the uh, the discussion today. And I've been trying to slip them in uh, as I can. Um, but you touched on two of them that I want to just talk about for a moment. So uh, we've talked a lot today about seasonality and what usually happens at this time of year. And 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 the charts that we've just looked at show that, yeah, that's actually pretty much how it's played out this year. So an interesting question is, is well, if markets are efficient, right? And there are these seasonal patterns that everybody knows about. <laughs> why do they still persist, right? Shouldn't they basically be already priced in? Well, normally, and and but again, there's there's certain things that occur every year that the markets do know about. So they invest based on those issues, right? So everybody knows about seasonality. So everybody kind of buys November and December. It's just, we know that, right? It's seasonally strong period of the year. Worst does, performance is made. Does that mean it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where I know markets go up, so I'm going to buy in at the beginning to right. ride it. And because so many people are buying in at the beginning to ride it, it actually causes the takeoff? Yeah, in, in a way. Yeah, absolutely. And and the other side of it is, is that you also have some effects that are going on that we talked about, um, you know, in, in October, which said, look, when you get the we, we wrote an article in 
think it was late September. I have to go pull it up now. But we said October. We said uh, weakness in October before the year end rally. And the reason for the year end rally was you get through earnings season. Then the, the blackout window opens up for stock buybacks. We've had a near record amount of stock buybacks in the last month. Just a, I mean, just a gorge of corporations buying back their own shares. Insider buying. Corporate executives have been buying shares hand over fist because that blackout window opened back up. So that starts the market rally. And then when the market starts to rally, everybody that was convinced it was a bear market and they're super bearish, they go, oh my gosh, I'm missing it. Then they jump in. That then drives the market higher, and, and you get this effect. Then every year we get mutual fund distributions. Then you have the portfolio window dressing for hedge funds, mutual funds, pension funds. Those are your big money. Those are that's your big money, right? It's not retail investors. They're the ones that are driving the year-end performance because they're balancing their positions for the end of the year reporting. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I said totally get what you're saying there. I'm also thinking, you know, smart institutional investors with supercomputer AI quant, you know, <laughs> algorithms could price in what should happen when the rebalancing happens and therefore drive prices up beforehand where, you know, you, you wouldn't know it, but, but, but obviously it happens. So, right. all right. Yeah, um, there's, there's certainly some arbitrage that goes on and, and don't, don't mistake that at all because that certainly does occur. Right. But it's certainly not smoothing out the seasonal patterns there. They right. still happen. Right. For the most part. Um, all right. Uh, the other question which you touched on, and maybe you've already fully answered it, but was, hey, it is now December. Uh, and so are there year end strategies, tasks that, you know, the, the prudent conscientious investor should be considering here at the end of the year? Obviously, you already talked about tax loss harvesting. Right. Is there anything else beyond that that you'd recommend? Uh, if you don't have an IRA open, you have to open it before year end um, for next filing season, right? So it has to be open before December 31st. Uh, so if you've never opened an IRA before, right? Yeah. You need to open one before year end and that way you'll have it for next year. And so, we, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but when's the deadline to fund it? Uh, tax filing. Okay, so you, you have to open it before the end of this year, but if you wanna contribute for 2023, you have up until right before you file your taxes next year. Yeah, right. Okay. But it has to be opened. And so, it has know, to one, be open. yeah. So, one thing that drives me crazy every year, we tell our, our clients as well in advance, we're like, look, we get the last week of, of the year off to all of our employees. So, if you need to do something for the end of your tax year, get it done now because there's not going to be anybody around. And yeah, every, good good luck, buddy. <laughs> everybody waits until the last minute to try to do this stuff. And what's going to happen is, is that whether you're trying to do it through your, yourself or through a brokerage firm, whatever. You know, you're just going to make you're just going to make things really difficult for yourself. So so do all your year end stuff, you know, do your tax loss selling, um, you know, take your take your capital gains that you need to take, uh, take your RMD payments, calculate those, get those out of your account. Do it early. Do a favor to your advisor and don't wait till the last minute. But also you know, getting it done in advance is is going to help you because. Everybody, everybody else is going to wait till the last minute, and you're going to have a lot of time, you know, a lot of difficulty trying to reach help, uh, get somebody to return a phone call, et cetera, because everybody's going to be swamped trying to take care of this stuff, everybody. So act now. All right. Um, I guess on this question, too. So we talk about a lot about the importance of having a financial plan, right? And, and we talked a lot last week about measuring your progress versus the plan, not by some arbitrary, you know, January 1st date. Um, I think I know what your answer is going to be here, but you know, is it is it better to start the new year fresh by making your plan at the start of the year, or you know, blowing the dust off last year's plan on January first and setting up for the year, or is it better to do it in December so that you can hit January first, you know, running? Yeah, if if you don't have a plan, first of all, if you don't have a financial plan, build one. Right. And, you know, very important to those things is don't you if you use some type of calculator that uses a stagnant rate of return, like, OK, you want to retire in 30 years, uh, you know, put in your rate of return, 8 percent a year, whatever it is. If, if, if that's the first question to ask you, throw it out the window because it's completely useless. Any financial plan built on a stagnant rate of returns, throw it out the window. It's completely useless. And how do you know that? Because November 30th, the market ended. 
at exactly the same price it was November 30th, two years ago. In other words, the market has done had zero rate of returns for two years and the markets are still not back to even. So you're still trying to make up losses. You're not making gains. So now if your plan is based on 8% a year, you've not only got to make up the 8% from the first year and the 8% from the second year, you've also got to make up the 8% in the coming year. So you've got to have just massive gains to try to make up those previous losses. And, and this is so that completely blows plans out, you know, market declines completely blow these plans out of water. And that's why like all these things like the fire movement died a smoldering death, because, you know, as soon as you have a market downturn, all these plans based on 8% returns go right out the window. So your plan needs to be adjusted for variable rates of return. Those variable rates of return need to be based on valuation levels. They also need to include inflation, um, a, a variable rate of inflation over time. You need to assume for both periods of higher inflation, lower inflation. Um, you need to uh, adjust your withdrawal rate during market decline. So if the market does decline, have a plan built in there for taking out less money from your, from your, from your assets during those periods. That's what a really good financial plan will do for you. That's, you know, that's what Richard and Danny do. Uh, they, they've spent years developing, you know, these type of, of structures, but it's just, it's just common sense that you've got to build in for these periods of time where you don't have a market return or heaven forbid, you have a 50% decline in the market at some point. So let, let, let me ask you about that. First off, the plans that I've used, um, what I like about them is they, they do Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah. Right. So you 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 basically have your goals and whatnot, and then they do you know, Monte Carlo. Basically, is it just runs it, it, it tremendous amount of um, probabilities or, or calculations, um, <clears throat> making all sorts of different assumptions for market returns, for inflation, whatever. Right. And they basically tell you, okay, after running thousands of of sensitivities on your plan you have a 98% chance of hitting your goal or you have a 21% chance of hitting it, right? And it, it gives you a good sense as to how vulnerable you are to a lot of these changes because nobody knows what's going to happen you know, in the future with these variables. So what you want to do is you want to test a whole bunch of them and see how you come out on each one of those you know, war game you know, trials. Yeah, you've, right? you've, got to be, you've got to be careful with those because a lot of plans, what they'll do is they'll, you'll see this graph and I'll have all these lines on it, right? And then like light gray, whatever. So those are all the, the tests. And then there's this one dark line that is the average of all those simulations. And that's what they're basing your rate of return on saying, oh, your success rate's based on this average of all these potential outcomes. That's not the way it works, right? That's the same thing as using an 8% rate of return over time because you're, you're trying to average how markets react. The problem with that is, is that you're looking over a period of time of 50 or 100 years. Over the last 100 years, let, let's back this up for a, for a quick second. Where does the idea come from that markets return 8% on average every year? Easy. I go back to 1900. I average every rate of, of return year going forward, add in dividends, subtract out inflation, I get 8%. Now, that's all fine and dandy. Markets don't do that every single year. You right. don't get 8% a year. Some years you get 20, some years you get negative 10. It's the down years. It's not the average. It's the down years that have the biggest impact to your financial plan. So any plan that uses Monte Carlo simulations, average rate of returns, throw it out the window. You've got to build a structure that says, hey, over the next 20 years, I'm going to build in a bear market over the next two years. I'm going to assume the market's going to be down 30% in 2024, 2025, I'm going to have three up years after that. And I'm going to have another down year in 2029. And my retirement date's 2030, whatever it is. Then see how your plan turns out. See how your risk tolerances turn out. See how the survivability of your plan turns out. Then you got to adjust your withdrawal rates for those periods where markets are declining because I can't take out market. I can't take out assets. If the market's down 10 and I'm taking out four, I'm down 14. I've, I've dramatically increased that downside risk in my portfolio. So you've got to extract periods of time saying, hey, I've got to have a cash buffer. This is what Richard and Danny talk about, having this, having this emergency fund set aside for those years, because you can't touch your assets in a down year. You've got to draw from this emergency fund during that down year. That's how you survive and win the long-term gain. All these other plans that are based on Monte Carlos, they're not worth the paper they're written on in most cases. 
All right. So I want to defend Monte Carlo a little bit in a second, but I want to underscore your main point here, which is about the importance of risk management and risk mitigation. And that hopefully I've beaten that drum uh, <laughs> you know, to death over the past couple of years of folks who have watched me on this channel. But this is where, you know, cash uh, buffers and hedges and, you know, all that stuff really come into play. Cause to your point, I totally agree with, which is limiting your downside is the best way to maximize your ability to hit your goals going forward. Um, what I do with the Monte Carlos is, you know, they show you the lines, right? They, they, each each sensitivity that they run, you know, is its own line. I look to see where my goal, how many of those lines fall below my goal, right? And so if it's only like- Yeah, that's, that's the right way to use it. Yeah, exactly. That's the right way to use it. Yes. Yeah. Because there's there's no guarantees. Yeah, there are going to be some scenarios where I don't hit my goals because the market crashes every year for the next 50 years, right? I, I, <laughs> of course, I'm not going to make my goals then, right? But as long as I'm like 98%, you know, certain, like that's where I begin to be like, okay, you know, I, 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 I feel like I'm in but, good territory. But, right. But that's a huge difference to what we were talking about. So if I run Monte Carlos, which we do that too, but what we're looking for is we say, okay, Here's my Monte Carlo rate of return that I need. And this is about setting expectations and saying, look, if I have an expectation, if I run all these Monte Carlo simulations and the vast majority of them are above, I'm just, I'm just throwing out a number, 4% yes. rate of return. That's the rate of return I need to be looking for for my portfolio saying, look, if as long as I can make 4%, I've got a 98, 99% chance of meeting my goals. Exactly. That's the right way to use it, right? Again, that's not the way most plans run because these off the box plans, these off the shelf calculators, et cetera, they're very, very basic and they don't take into account all the variabilities that happen with markets over long term time frame. So it's very important to get really behind those numbers and understand that what the financial plan is for is to say, this is how much risk you need to take to reach your goal with certainty. And then you build a portfolio, most importantly, to, to meet that goal, not exceed that goal, because there's a huge difference. If my plan says 4%, and I go, yeah, but Adam, give me 5%. That's a 25%, that's a 20 increase in the amount of return I need, but that's almost a 100% increase in the amount of risk I've got to add to the portfolio just to create a 1% rate of return additional rate in the portfolio. That's where the mistakes happen, and that's where you wind up losing too much money and missing your goal. All right. So totally agree. And I think we now look at Monte Carlo the same way. Yeah. Um, so here's the other question I want to throw into the mix here, which is um, it's one thing to say, OK, yeah, I need to get that 4% rate of return and we think we can get it. And, you know, if I follow that path, I'll hit this milestone in five years and this milestone in 10 years. Um, that's one way to do the planning. Another way to do the planning is to start and say, where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in 10 years? and say, okay, great, here's the number that you're shooting for. We think through our planning and analysis with your investments, we can get you X percent rate of return. Maybe that gets you there, maybe it doesn't. Um, but as you are then proceeding towards that goal and you're having check-ins you know, with your, your team over time, if you're off target at all, it brings in the ability to have to say, okay, so what else can you do besides relying on the markets to get to that goal, right? So in other words, you know, we talk about the importance of kind of the earning side as well as the savings and investing too. So it brings in the ability to say, hey, because market conditions are a little bit different than we thought they were going to be, rather than dial up the risk of the portfolio by saying, oh, now we need to get a bigger return going forward because the markets have gone down and therefore we're taking on potentially a lot more risk, right? Going from four to five, that's 20, 25% gain in risk here now. Maybe it's what can you do to put away an extra, you know, X percent every month or quarter going forward, which will then help you get to your goal, but the risk is is down. And then if the market, you know, starts performing better for us, well, then maybe it actually starts out performing for you. Yeah. No, I mean, look, that should be the basis of your plan, period. You should not rely on the market to do anything. You know, if, if in my perfect world, your return would be zero in your plan every year. And you'd say, look, if I want to reach a million dollars in retirement, how much money do I have to save every month between now and then to get there? Right. Because if I do that, if, if my whole plan mentally is based on what I'm saving. Right. I live like Charlie. Look, Charlie Munger just passed away. Uh, rest in peace. Brilliant man. 
one thing he says is, hey, if you want to be rich, spend less than you make. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's not rocket science. So if you build a plan based solely on your savings, all, all the, look, this is where everybody goes wrong with the markets, right? And this is, this is a function of, of, of the media. It's a function of Wall Street. It's a function of, of everybody else. Because what everybody's figured out, Wall Street, the media, et cetera, is that if I can get you to throw money into the market, they make money, right? Uh, in fact, I'm writing an article. Uh, it's this weekend's newsletter talking about why Wall Street analysts are always optimistic. In the chart that I have in there, I've got two charts in there showing where the retail investor lands relative to Wall Street analysts. You're at the bottom of the list. Nobody cares about you. They don't care if you make money. They don't care if you lose money. You are so far at the bottom of the list. Why? Because their their clients are institutions. They're the guys that are doing secondary offering for IPOs for doing investment banking for you know uh, you know doing bond offerings for. That's where all the money's made, right? What you what Wall Street needs you for is they need you to sell the product to, right? If I do an IPO, I got to sell it to somebody. They need the they need the patsy it. at the poker table. Yep. Exactly. So so if you build a if you build your financial plan saying, look. I'm going to save my way to retirement, which is the way you should do it, right? How much money do I need to save to have enough when I retire? What the market is for, and this is all the market is for, is to ensure that those savings are adjusting for the rate of inflation over time so that the purchasing power of the dollars that you saved 30 years ago have the same purchasing power today, 30 years later, when you go into retirement. A million dollars in 1980, you could retire on. You could make 12% from the bond market. You had a million dollars. Your cost of living was about $30,000. Easy. A million dollars today, 30, 40, 50 years later because of inflation and everything else that's gone on, it ain't going to cut it. You're not going to survive in retirement on a million bucks if you have a you know, 60, 70, $80,000 standard of living. Well, so, and especially if if yields go back down to where they were just a couple of years ago, you're certainly right. not going to be able to. Right. But look, the look, even if you take 5% yields on the treasury, right? Yeah. I have a million dollars. I put it in treasury at 5%. It's only 50 grand. Yeah. 50 grand. What's the average cost of living today? 65. You're still short, right? So you have to, so if you look at, if you change your focus from how much I can gamble and speculate in the markets to try to, you know, try to get rich from investing, and change it to how do I protect my savings and make sure my savings adjust for inflation over time? A, you're going to do a lot better. You'll lower your risk tolerance in the, in the markets and you will reach your goal because the primary driver for your goal is how much money you're saving, not how much money you're hoping to make out of the markets. But see, yeah. but when we changed the whole market to a casino, we devastated retirement savers. And this is why 80% of Americans can't retire because they have no money in the bank. Even though they're invested, this whole idea that markets just make everybody wealthy, it hasn't worked in 40 years, right? So if right. it did- Because as you've rich. said many times, you know, you, we, if it did, we wouldn't have these stats that, you know, yeah. two thirds of American households can't come up with 400 bucks in an emergency or whatever it is, right? Exactly right. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, there's a I think, a direct analog we can t try or tie as well to the housing market, right? Which, which used to- appreciate it about the rate of inflation uh, right up until, you know, the end of the 90s and all the financialization and everything. And now it's become this massive Ponzi scheme that everybody is totally afraid of, of bursting because that's where most Americans have, quote unquote, the majority of their wealth right now. Right. And, um, so and by the way, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sorry to interrupt you, but that's a that's an awesome point you just made. It's not that houses used to appreciate at the rate of inflation. That's what they should appreciate at. Right. Your, your real estate should appreciate at the rate of inflation over time. And that's what they did all the way through the 90s. And then when we got into adjustable rate mortgages, you know, uh, dual mortgages to avoid, you know, uh, PMI insurance, ninja loans, all this other stuff, we turned, you know, the housing market into a speculative asset. And, you know, the, the, the consequences are now that people can't afford to buy a house. So I'm probably going to get, you know, just skewered for saying this, but... Um... There's this this concept of of um, insufficient but necessary, right? They're like steps you have to take, which in and of themselves aren't going to solve your problem, but they're an essential part of solving the problem. So you got to take them. Um, and I think to retire wealthy, retire securely, 
you you have to invest smart, smartly, wisely, prudently. But I think it might be insufficient, right? It's it's but it's necessary. You got to do it. But what you also have to do is you've got to focus on the earning part, and you got to be saving and squirreling away a lot of you know the excess of what you're earning and spending less than than what you're what you're producing. Uh, and it's the combination of everything that gets you there. And the problem is, is I think so many people have been told, you know, we all want the easy solution and we've all been sold that, oh, no, 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 investing is, is what makes you rich, right? As long as you put money away, it's going to go bananas over time and it, you're, every stock is going to be a meme stock eventually and you're going to make a ton of money and you're going to retire, you know, on a, on a tropical island somewhere. Hopefully, and I know you and your team are there trying to get people the best risk, risk adjusted return that you can get. But my point is, is I think maybe we really have to take an honest, hard look in the, the mirror as a society and say, look, the, the way to build wealth is through hard work over time and, you know, diligence and all that type of stuff. And we can't expect our homes to become lottery tickets for us. And we can't expect our portfolios. We can't give them unrealistic expectations as well. We just have to commit to doing the hard work over time. And if we do, we'll get there, right? And, and the, if, if serendipity happens along the way, fantastic. But yeah, look, and, and look, there are very few people in the world that have ever gotten rich investing. I, I, you can probably count them on one hand. And you know, well, Warren Buffett got rich. No, no, no. Warren Buffett didn't get rich investing. He got rich investing other people's money, right? right. And, and that's into businesses crazy. that he could control, not just speculative paper. Absolutely. Yeah. Ray Dalio. How did Ray Dalio get so rich investing other people's money? So you take a look at any of these really rich investors that, you know, Steve Cohen, Ray Dalio, all of them. How did they get rich? Did they get rich just investing their own money? No, they all got rich running hedge funds, you know, pension funds or whatever, right? But they were investing other people's money in the market. That's where they made their money. And so, you know, this is why it's, it's you know, you know, I get emails from, you know, your viewers and they say, you know, hey, I'm 22, 23. Um, you know, I've, you know, I've been watching Adams and, and, you know, I want to protect my wealth from the next major downturn in the market. I'm like, that's the worst thing you can do. Best thing you can do is follow these steps. Maximum fund, so out of every paycheck, first thing you do is break your maximum funding for your 401k plan down by 12 months. Hit that number every single month right out of your paycheck. You're going to reduce your taxes to the federal government by fully funding your 401k plan. If your wife doesn't work and doesn't have an IRA, uh, uh, 401k plan, do a spousal IRA for her. Take that money right out of your paycheck. Fund that spousal IRA. Then save up an additional amount of money. When you get that to ten dollars or $20,000, buy an S&P 500 index fund. And then every month, just keep cramming money into that. Why? Because you've got 30, 40 years ahead of you You've got plenty of time. And so if you're saving 30 to 40% of your income and investing it, you're going to do great. You're, you're not going to have any financial trouble ever. And it doesn't matter. All these other narratives about the world coming to an end, whatever, it doesn't matter. You're going to win over time simply because of inflation and time. And that's and that's that's the hard truth. That, that just plays out over time. You're not going to be a massive multi-trillionaire at all. Uh, you know, you're going to get an average rate of return over time. You're going to have years where you're losing a lot of money when the markets do go through downturns, but you keep saving and you keep putting that money away because you have time. Where you need, really need risk management is when you're in your 40s, your 50s, you're heading into retirement and you can't suffer a major loss to your portfolio. By that time, mostly, you know, look, when you're young, you don't have any money anyway. So if you lose money, it's not that much. But when you're in your 40s, 50s, you've now got your nest egg theoretically saved up. That's where you've got to really do the risk management. You've got to be worried about these, these downturns in the markets, the things that will cause those cataclysmic events, et cetera. And you've got to prepare and manage for that stuff. But if you're young and you have time, man, just, you know, the, the, so it's, it's the 50, 20, 30 rule. You 50% of your money that you make. That goes to your essentials. That's your so your your mortgage should be no more than fifteen percent of your total net after tax income. Your mortgage shouldn't be more than fifteen percent of that. Um, that includes rent. So, um, you know, then that's the rest of your util that's your utilities, that's your cell phone. You know, well, I can't afford an iPhone fifteen on that. Well, no, you may have to use a flip phone, right? Because that's all you can afford. 20% is your discretionary budget. That's what you're, you know, going out with. Look, I don't want you to not have any fun in your life. 20%, that's your dating money, that's your spending money on your wife, whatever it is. 
30% is to savings. You've got to set that goal and you've got to get yourself working that goal. And then as your income increases, that goal's never, you don't adjust that. It's always the same percentages of every after-tax dollar you bring in because that's how you're going to build wealth over time. And, and people will, and when I tell this stuff to people, I immediately get lashbacks like, oh, that's impossible. Nobody can do that. I've been doing it for 40 years, right? And it doesn't matter. You can do it. You just got to be willing to sacrifice to do it. You can't have everything. You've got to have delayed gratification. Just because you think you want it doesn't mean you really need it. And look, a really good rule of thumb is, is that if you say, look, I really want something. I want an iPhone, whatever it is. Wait, you know, put it, put it on, you know, put it on the side, wait three months. And in three months, if you still really need it, then you probably really need it. Maybe you should make plans to go buy it for cash. Um, not on credit, not on payment plans. If you can't pay cash, you can't afford it. So if you follow those rules, though, you'll be great. You'll never have to worry about financial troubles, markets, economies, nothing. You're going to be fine. But you got to do, like you said, Brad, you got to have the discipline to do it. To do it, yeah. And and in, in my my rant earlier, I, I don't want to discount the um, the benefits and advantages that you know the the miracle compounding puts at your back over enough time on this. Um, so, you know, I, I, when I say necessary, but insufficient or insufficient, but necessary, um, I, I don't want to underplay uh, the, 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 the long-term benefits that, that this does give you over time. And Lance, I agree with, with just about everything you said. And I think the percentages that you gave super duper useful for folks. I appreciate you doing that. I agree with all of that. Um, I think maybe the one thing I'll push back on is um Adopting risk management early in your life is not the worst thing that these yeah, guys could do. No, it's, it's not. It, 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 and, and Adam, let me tell you why. I'll tell you why it is. Because this is why what happens to every investor over time, they adopt these ideas of risk management, right? I'm going to be, uh, oh, uh, Adam said that there's a crash coming next year. So I'm going to get all out of the market. And then maybe the crash comes, right? We saw this in 2008. Great example of this. And again, I'm only talking about if you're in your 20s. I'm not talking about your 30s, not talking about your 40s, not talking about your 50s. You're in your 20s. You don't have any money invested, right? You may have a few hundred bucks. So if you lose half of 400 bucks, it's not the end of the world in terms of your retirement. Get another 200 bucks, go work an extra job, go do a side gig, whatever, put the 200 bucks back in there, get back to saving and investing. But risk management for most, for the vast majority of people is the worst thing they can do because they'll get themselves out of the market at the bottom. They won't get into the market when the market rallies. Then they buy the top of the next market. We see this over and over. This is why the average investor buy lows and sells highs constantly. October, great reasoning. You know, I mean, exactly the same comments. In October, all the people that were on my Twitter feed that were listening to you were going, oh, this Adam said this market is going to go down from here. And yeah, I was like, no, it's clear. Not I didn't say happen. that either. I was giving I, I know. I'm, 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 I'm picking on you, but I'm exaggerating a bit. Yes. Yeah. But the point is, is that people take this risk management and they, there's a there's an important task about risk management. It's understanding the range of possibilities when you're managing risk. I've got to manage for the risk of being wrong as well as the risk of being right. So what most I'm, people do is they get out entirely under the fear that they're going to be wrong. So we're we're in agreement. I'm not. I'm not. I, I get what you're saying, and I'm actually in agreement with you. Which is, risk management is a practice, right? And what you don't want to do is be driven by fear, which is totally what you're very accurately saying. A lot of people do is they make terrible decisions out of fear. But risk management is a practice. So two things: one, you can do way stupider things in your twenties, and I, you and I both have, right? Hey. I mean, Right, right there with you. Yeah, you can you can go and you know buy the ridiculously overpriced sports car that you have no business buying. Right, you could be throwing it all into Shiba Inu and Dogecoin or whatever. Right, I mean there are way stupider things that people could be doing with their money than being yep. a little bit too conservative. And and the reason why I mention this is it's a practice. You have to get comfortable with risk, both with okay, how do I protect against certain risks that I'm concerned about, but also how do I not take how do I not be too conservative, right? And you're going to err on both sides. And so all I'm saying is, is I, I agree with what you're saying, which is you want to lean much more into risk taking, if you will, when you can afford it when you're younger, but, but you also want to be 
beginning to exercise the muscles and the awareness of when do I need to pay attention to what, right? And, and through all this, work with a good financial advisor who can be giving you advice and you can be learning and reacting to it. So Absolutely. look, and if you want to do that, you're, so let's say, you, let's go back to our 20s example, right? So first thing you do is fully fund your 401k plan. Second thing, fully fund your spousal IRA or have her fund her 401k plan. Then have your emergency fund set aside for bad times, right? Because that's, you don't want to have to tap into your assets when something goes wrong. Then you save up an additional ten or twenty thousand dollars, right? And you set that aside into an, a speculation account. Go learn how to do the market, right? First thing you do is 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 to learn how markets work. Is buy an index fund, right? And don't touch it. Just watch right. it. Right. But ten thousand dollars in SPY, watch it. Learn how the markets work. Okay, market was down today. Why was the market down today? Market was down last month. Why was the market down last month? Right? Or it was up. Why? Understand how the market works. Then break that, break the index down into its subcomponents, which are the sectors. Okay. What's driving this sector? What's driving this sector? Is it interest rates? Is it inflation? Is it economic activity? What is it? What's driving these individuals? So learn, then learn how the sectors work. Once you understand how the sectors work, then you break it down again into its smaller parts, which are the individual stocks. Okay. Within the financial sector, why is JP Morgan rallying and Berkshire Hathaway falling? Right. You know, whatever. So then you you learn this over, and this takes years, right? This is not right. this is the three months worth. And just, just to be clear, this is your drive the car before you figure out how to rebuild the engine, right? Well, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, if if I if I took my son into the garage right now and there was, you know, all the parts to build a car, he wouldn't have a clue, right? But you know, I can work with him and I can take all those parts and we can build a car together. That we can do. But it's better to learn how the car operates first before you start breaking it down into its components, right? And, and that's, so if you want to take 10,000 and say, look, if I lose this 10,000 entirely, it's my, I'm, I'm, this is my investment education, right? This is just like spending money on college. And if I, and it doesn't have to be 10, I'm just through a number. I could be a thousand, it could be yeah. 5,000, 500, it doesn't matter. Just a number that if it goes to zero, it doesn't affect anything else because why? I'm fully funding my 401k. That's a very conservative investment. I've got my my IRA very conservative. I'm not speculating. I'm not buying Bitcoin in my IRA. I'm not buying Bitcoin in my 401k plan. Uber, uber conservative. Be uber conservative in those retirement accounts because those have 30 years to grow and they're going to be there for you in retirement. That's what that money's for. So, I mean, if you put it all in money market, that's fine. All right. You know, it's it's completely okay to do that because over time, it's about the the the, the savings that you're doing for your retirement speculate with the money in your after-tax account. At least if you lose it, you can write it off on your taxes, but learn how the market works. And then once you're adept at understanding how markets work and how they ebb and they flow over time, how they how they respond to certain events, then you can take that information and then start going to manage your 401k and IRA a bit better. Okay. All right. Look, um, I think we've done a good job of being financial dads here. Um, I've got another dad rant I want to try to get to this week because we didn't get it to it last week, but we got a lot of other wood to chop beforehand. So it might need to be punted again. Um, I want to get to your trades. Before I do, though, two other topics, maybe even quick three. Um, we I mentioned we were going to talk about um, liquidity. Yep. And this is interesting because you mentioned earlier that the six-month average for the leading indicators leading economic indicators is beginning to tick up, which you know folks would say, oh, hey, maybe we're getting out of the woods here, right? The data I'm about to mention may contradict that a little bit. Um, this comes from Simon White uh, of Bloomberg, by the way, a guy I've been trying to get on this program, having a hard time tracking down his contact info, but I really like the work that he does. Here's what he had to say. He said, liquidity has been buoyant over the last month, principally due to the approximately $200 billion rise in central bank reserves. <laughs> Money market funds de facto funding the fiscal deficit via the purchase of T-bills and the government withdrawing funds from the Treasury's account at the Federal Reserve, combined to boost high-powered liquidity, driving a rally in stocks and bonds. So this may be partly why November was such a great month. But the, that impulse from reserves has started to fade. The one-month change of the one-month change of the Federal Reserves uh, of Federal Reserves is now falling. I'm going to show you a chart on this in a second, which translates as the absence of a tailwind for stocks. But a big drop in the ISM would amplify hard landing fears. Stocks in this case would be likely to sell off as falling bond yields start to reflect a Fed cutting rates to try to stem a recession, which stocks are very much not discounting at the moment. Um, 
So we've got this, this basically change in impulse of federal reserves that is generally a leading indicator for the markets. And I'm going to try to pull up a, a chart of this that we can I, react to I, here, I, Lance, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Got the, I've got the chart right here because I publish the chart on a regular basis. Yeah. And All this right. was this was also a function of our newsletter last weekend um, in particular. So here, let me uh, share a screen with you. I love how you're anticipating uh, the data I'm going to bring up here, Lance. Yeah, shows well, that we're... I've, I've been building that financial liquidity chart for about two years now. Um, and it's kind of it's, it's kind of been catching on more and more and more and more people are producing it now. Um, but so if we look, if we take a look at. Yeah, so this is a, a monetary conditions index. And this is basically taking into account liquidity. And, and what we're seeing is, is an uptick in this liquidity. This is a long term chart of this. But we saw an uptick in November in that liquidity. Now, also, too, monetary conditions as a function are also declining. So, again, that financial tightness that we talked about is also starting to come off a, a bit because of this rally in liquidity that we've seen. So we're going to see more and more of, you know, you know, that that rally is as long as we're seeing that monetary liquidity flow coming in. And again, Simon's right that if we got a really bad economic report, et cetera, the Fed may step in. But ISM was was basically zero uh, from last month. It's 46.7 last month, 46.7 this month. So there was no change in the manufacturing index at all. So, again, when we start to put in the year over year rates of change in these indexes, we're seeing that economic data starting to improve on a year over year basis. Doesn't mean that it's it's good economic data, don't get me wrong about that, but it does mean that we're starting to see an, an improvement in the year over year rate of change. And that's just simply a function of how the data works over time, right? We talked about that with inflation, the year over year rate of change would bring inflation down, which is what we've seen for the last year. So, you know, we're gonna see more of this, you know, type of, of confusing data, shall I say, because we're, we're just simply to the point that we've been in this recessionary downturn cycle for so long now, it's, it's going on 18 months, the inverted yield curves, as an example, very long stretch of inverted yield curves, no recession. Those are going to start to, theoretically, those are going to finally start to improve just simply because of the amount of time that we've been in recessionary territory. Doesn't mean we won't have a recession at some point. But the longer that it goes without us having a recession, the, 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 the likelihood of having one is starting to get contracted a bit. Right. So I'm just going to pull up this chart because I think it, it I, I just want to show the discrepancy he's talking about because I, I, I think this is on a one, one so month change and one month change. It's on a shorter time frame. Um, but, but it shows this, you know, right here at the end, you can see the divergence. Yep. Right where you see the the yellow is um, where the impulse is actually now starting to recede, but the stock market, which is there in the dark line, um, uh, it, you know, it, its percent change has been shooting the moon of recent. And so, at some point, these are likely going to have to um, come back together again. And it's either going to be uh, the reserves are going to have to shoot back up again, or that the market's going to have to potentially, you know stop at least stop growing <laughs> <laughs> well and that's and that's and that's another part where you know that could contribute to a sell-off in the market because you know again we are start we you know we we did see this big kind of uptick in liquidity and again it, it's interesting because liquidity you know despite the fact the fed's doing qt and you know we've had high interest rates liquidity has basically been flat uh for 18 months it's just gone sideways and it upticked here just recently so you know, this whole idea, and this is why last year, everybody was like, oh, we're going to have this big bear market. We're going to be down, you know, 40, 50 percent, whatever it is. And it never happened because we didn't have that big drain of, of liquidity out of the market that everybody was expecting. Right. And I think that that's, if anything, I think that has been the surprise factor this year is how much liquidity has has remained in the system, been put in the system, even though we've been told, oh, you know, Fed tightening, uh, you know, unprecedented uh, aggressiveness and, and hiking interest rates, there's been enough going on behind the scenes, both in terms of, of reserves and in terms of fiscal spending, uh, fiscal deficit spending, that's been kind of keeping the party going along a lot longer than folks could have imagined. And of course, the big question for 2024 is, is you know, is it going to be able to continue or not? And of course, there's 
A lot of folks who are saying, oh, they'll never let it uh, abate during an election year. Um, and then there are others who obviously have differences of opinion. And that gets me to one of the questions that folks asked, Lance, which I just want to ask you since we're now officially in December, which is, you know, knowing that you're going to be on this program every week uh, during the year to give us updates uh, on a weekly basis, what's your general outlook right now for 2024 for the markets? Um, sum that up for you in three words. I don't know. Yeah, I know you're going to go there. I know. Well, and, and the reason is, is uh, here. Oh, by the way, this was uh, uh, before we jump there real quick. Hold on. This was the chart I was looking for. And again, it's 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 the same chart you were just looking at, but a little bit smoother data flow. But this is the S index. Uh, this is the which is. Yeah, you know, that's it. Right. So this is the it, it's the, 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 the liquidity index. So. Think about this for a second. It's the Fed balance sheet minus the Treasury generally account minus reverse repo. So in order for the index to go up, that means the balance sheet actually has to be expanding because you're subtracting everything else from the balance sheet. So the balance sheet for the Fed has been expanding despite the fact that they're theoretically doing QT, right? So, but that's, you, you see that uptick. And again, this is what I'm saying is like, you know, since October, 2022, when this bull market started. So, so go back to the, you know, early 2022, liquidity index was falling with the market. And remember in October of 2022, you and I were talking about, hey, it, we're, you know, we're so negative in the markets. We're going to get a rally um, coming out of this because, you know, you had everybody was super bearish in October of 2022. And so it has to be, you know, ultimately the bottom of, of, of the kind of the bear market cycle we were in. And that's exactly when liquidity went flatline. So liquidity goes flatline, the market starts to get, to go higher because liquidity is now stabilized. And then you have the Fed, you know, Fed takes action with the SVB, you know, uh, you know, banking crisis. They start the, the, the uh, bank bailout program, the, the bank term funding program. Uh, that provided a, a big bump to liquidity of the markets, so that got filtered into the, the markets. And then recently, here you've had this this recent uptick after the sell off in the market in October. And it's interesting because as the market was selling off and as interest rates were going up, that consumer confidence was getting ratcheted down. I mean, consumers were getting very negative in September, October. So I'm really not surprised that the Fed made that change that they did, and you've seen liquidity coming back into the market. Because the Fed doesn't want a recession. They want a soft landing. And they don't want deflation. They want inflation. They just want 2% inflation. So, you know, they're working behind the scenes to try to land this plane. We'll see how successful they're going to be. But, you know, this is, this is going to be the question going into 2024. And this is why I don't know is the answer. And, uh, in fact, uh, Tuesday's post on our website is talking about Wall Street predictions for 2024. Everybody's super bullish for next year, 5,100, 5,500, 5,300. All the Wall Street firms are expecting this bull market to continue. I think that's a risky bet because there's a, there's a whole lot of data out there that suggests that next year could be another very sloppy year. Um, you know, like we saw in 2022, maybe, you know, part of 2023 where, you know, we have this rally, then another decline and another rally as we continue to kind of work through you know, this slower economic environment because, you know, earnings expectations are for $220 a share next year. If you have slower economic growth, you're not going to get to 220. Valuations are going to be a very important factor of that. Here, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll sneak I'll sneak you a peek at uh, some charts from Tuesday's article real quick. And because I did some analysis on this showing, you know, valuation structures and, and what this um, theoretically is going to look like. Let me uh, back up. So, okay. So that's not what I'm looking for, but here's, that was 2023 estimates. Um, oh, going the wrong way. Bear with me. Sorry. So this is estimating the S&P. So this is based solely on valuations. No recession next year. Is, and this is what the market's betting on. And assuming we can maintain 22 times earnings, that puts a target at 48.45 for the S&P 500. If you assume a recession, a soft landing recession, valuations fall to 17, which is kind of historical average, then you're talking about 3744. 
So from 4,500 where we are now to 3744, that's about a 17% decline. Um, if we look at the historical length of recessions and market declines, that would be completely normal, right? You have right. a recession. And, and, sorry, just to make sure that that's soft landing equals 17% decline. Right. A, okay. a hard landing, you know, a, a, a normal recession is on average about a 33% decline. Very, very similar to what we saw in uh, March of 2020, right? So we have 33% down, three-month three month recession. So now if we take a look at a multiple expansion, which was this year, right? So 2022, uh, sorry, 2023, you had multiple expansion. And so if we assume that we actually expand multiples from say 22, 23 times earnings to 24, 24 and a half, now you've got a target of 53.95. That's about in line with where Wall Street's expecting right now. So what they're expecting is, and this is all assuming $220 a share in December of 2024 for the S&P. Again, <laughs> the big risk is, is that if you have slower economic growth, earnings are gonna have to come down. And in fact, um, you know- But Lance, if, that's, that's millennial- earnings season game. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely correct. So we can price this out though. And this is your range of outcomes for 2024. Take your pick, right? And, and so if you're super bullish and you're going to 220 a share, then you know, you're looking at 5,400 be long stocks. If you think you're going to have a reduction in earnings per growth, valuations are going to matter and markets have to reprice for lower valuations. That doesn't mean the markets will be down 20% next year. That's just one theoretical possibility. But you're certainly going to have a year of much lower rates of return than you know a market that's up you know six eight nine ten percent next year. This is super useful, and there are times where I really do um, feel for the people listening on a podcast without seeing these charts. Uh, this is a great chart, um, you know, basically showing the, the ranges of what could happen under these different scenarios. Um, well, let's go back. That, to that, 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 sorry, that whole article is going to be out on Tuesday. So if you go to our website, realinvestmentadvice.com, on Tuesday. The whole article will be there. For you me. can go, go see the charts there. Great. And the chart that you just kicked all this off with, right? The liquidity chart. Um, you know, I do, I look at charts like that in Simon White's and I go back to a comment I made to you at the beginning of this year when right after I interviewed Michael Howell and I interviewed a few other people about liquidity, but had a really deep dive uh, interview on liquidity with Michael Howell. And I was like, Lance, are we just overthinking all this? Like, is it just all about liquidity flows? Net liquidity yeah. flows into the market, right? I mean, could we just could we just only look at that and just ignore everything else and pretty much be eighty five percent on all the time? <laughs> and certainly, that's what that sort of seems to show, right? I mean, what yeah. happened in twenty twenty two when the markets lost, you know, twenty x percent and the bond market had its worst year in forever, right? It was the tide went out, liquidity rise. You know what changed? Well, we stabilized. We started putting more money in, especially after uh, the um, banking uh, instabilities there. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe that's just always tells the tale, right? And, and also because liquidity hasn't been rising as fast as the S&P right now, maybe that gives us a bit more confidence that the S&P is going to be due for some sort of correction at some point in time, just because if liquidity is all that matters, it's getting a little bit ahead of it. Yeah, no, and, and look, it, 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 you know, since 2009, um, you know, I'll produce a chart on a regular basis that shows the Fed balance sheet versus the market and all the different events that have gone on. Um, you know, and, and it, it's clear. I mean, if the Fed's expanding their balance sheet and you're putting capital, you know, the, let me be, let me back up one second because this is really important. I get a lot of emails talking about you know Fed liquidity and you know how that's going to create inflation and you know that's they're they're just printing money. The Fed does not print money, right? The Treasury prints money, right? So they're the ones that produce the money. What the Fed does is they do an asset swap. All they're doing is digital ones and zeros. They say, okay, Bank of America, you've got a you know, billion dollars worth of this 10-year treasury coupon. I'm gonna credit your, your reserve account with the Federal Reserve for a billion dollars. You're gonna give me that bond. And they do an asset swap. That is not inflationary. It doesn't create more money in the system. It boosts asset prices because that money in that reserve account then goes through the Bank of America's prop trading desk. It gets invested into stocks, so forth yep. and so on. And that's how it affects the markets. But this is why during the entirety of 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, we never had inflation. Inflation was limping along at 2%. Um, you know, the Fed was keeping rates at zero, trying to keep inflation at 2 The Fed was actually fighting to keep inflation at 2%. 
because if they had hiked rates or done anything at that point, inflation right. would have dropped and we've been in a recession. Right. K keeping CPI propped up near 2%. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But but importantly, you know, the when the Fed does QE, that is not inflationary. It's just an asset swap. So, you know, that's that's the big differential that we've got to be aware of is that and this is why the Fed feels very confident that, you know, they've talked about, you know, the rate hikes and they're not worried about an economic slowdown. They're not worried about a recession because they have the tools to offset that. That means that their tools are QE and right. and zero interest rates, right? And they'll, and they'll do that in a heartbeat. Make money and, cheap and create a bunch of it. Yep. Exactly. So, you know, but that's, but all they're doing is asset swaps, right? That's, that's all they're doing. They're making money available to the banks, not the individual. And so, so we say, well, Lance, we just had inflation running at 9%. It wasn't because of the Fed. It was because we sent checks to households from the treasury, right? The treasury printed money, sent checks to households. Those didn't come yep. from the Fed, they came from the treasury. All of a sudden, people had money to spend, and they went out and bought stuff in a time where the economy was shut down. You had so you had lots of demand, no supply. That's your that's inflation. That's how you get inflation. That had nothing to do with the Fed. Yep, totally agree. Um, uh, okay, where to take this? I got to lay on the plane because we're running out of time <laughs> here. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna push Fresh off land. the rant. <laughs> I'm going to push off the rant again, um, which is too bad because it's it's an interesting wait, one. Wait, um, what's, and it what's, has to... Just give me the topic. What's the topic? Yeah, no, the, the, the topic is kind of the epidemic of anxiety and depression in this country and really what it's really what might be the root cause of it. And I'll have to oh, I know that. I, I, I know that answer. I, you probably do, but we're going to. Social move media. <laughs> no, that's a symptom. Um, it is. An no, no. It's symptom media. I, I will. I will promise you Facebook, Twitter. That is, I can tell you from today, that is the root cause of depression in this country. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, look, I would, I would say it's definitely a massive contributor, but I don't think it's the main <laughs> cause. But, but, and I think you'll agree with me, and we'll have a great discussion on it. But it's going to yeah. not have to be this week. No, um, so, so uh, okay. Um, TLT. Tons of people asking about it. Um, two, two questions about bonds. Um, yeah. One, has your outlook that you've shared with us in the past changed at all? You know, you're revising any parts of it, given what's happened recently. Um, and then secondly, no. OK, but I'll let you expand on that if you want to. Um, and then um, what what let, let's say what 10 year Treasury yield would be your exit target on this trade? So first of all, the, the outlook. So, again, let me be clear that my outlook on bonds has not changed because as I told you before, it's an 18 to 36 month outlook. Um, we've had a very nice rally in bonds since the last month. So if you're trade, if you're trading bonds, right? So if you bought bonds a month ago and it's a trade, sell them because bonds are very overbought right now. You're going to get a correction, and you can buy them back for your next trade. I'm not trading bonds. We don't trade. We don't trade for our clients like that. We make long term investments. So. Our thesis is still 18 to 36 months. That's still an economic slowdown, potentially slash recession. Fed's going to have to cut rates to zero at some point. When that occurs, yields are going to fall. Um, and our target is probably somewhere between one, one and a half percent, which should correspond with where inflation winds up by the time we get there. Remember, yields are just a function of inflation and economic growth. So if, if as inflation and economic growth approach 2%, so will yields. Okay. And is that sort of what you're looking at? as a that's where we think this this bet we're making or this investment thesis we're making it's going to probably go in that direction when we head near oh, yeah. there we're going to think about lighting up no you can't you can't sustain economic growth above two percent because of the debt so the debt's going to drag you to two percent so as the debt drags you to two percent that's going to drag inflation to two percent as you continue to weigh on economic sustainability Yields will fall to align with economic growth and inflation because those all have to work together. You, you can't have one out of whack. So, you know, you know, if you take a look at, you know, GDP right now, we're running at about, you know, four, you know, we just clipped off 5.2% GDP for the third quarter. We're going to be somewhere around three, three and a half, probably in fourth quarter. Uh, inflation's running around three, three and a half percent. So, you know, interest rates are starting to come back down towards that level. They got, we talked about a couple of weeks ago how bonds had gotten deeply. Uh, undervalued relative to the economic data. So that's now starting to finally align itself. And that's going to kind of start to hover around here somewhere. But as, as the economy continues to grind lower, that's going to pull rates down with it. Okay. 
All right. Um, trades. What trades, if any, did you make? None this week. Okay. And you had sort of prepped us for that because you're you're still, I believe, kind of hunkered down for the short-term correction that you see in the markets, after which it happens, you will then take action. Right. Yeah. We, we did our tax loss selling. We've raised cash. Uh, we've been rebound. You know, we were buying stuff in October. Um, we rebound. You know, we did our tax loss selling really kind of in November on the rally. And so now we're holding a little bit of extra cash, looking for a pullback here to round out the rest of our positions. Okay. And if we had had more time here, I was going to ask some questions about the banking sector. One, just because we still continue to see the BTFP emergency fund continue to hit record highs um, as money market fund inflows uh, hit record highs as well, leaving banks. Um, that's not that bearish. Yeah, that's, not, that's not that bearish. Well, I mean, but I was going to add a few other things onto it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are. This is you know, take a look at this chart, right? And look, it's just a function is is that high interest rates impair the collateral of these banks. These these banks all own treasuries, right? For the most part. Um, so yeah, they're they're swapping out these loans to keep their collateral values in line, so they're not shut down like regional banks were. So you know that's 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 the the use of this is just the change in rates and collateral values and those type of things, but. It's not an, uh, an impending economic doom scenario. There is some certainly some stress in the financials. I'm not saying that at all. Um, we're very light on financial exposure right now because of commercial real estate. But, you know, we're going to be working through that uh, process over the next 12 months. Right. So we can't have the full discussion now, but I'm happy to have it when we come on next time. But there are a few other things that was getting add on to it, including, you know, the commercial real estate risk. But, um, you know, the, the BTFP is a one year loan. To these banks and so we are now getting close to the one-year anniversary where these guys are going to have to take these things back on yeah. their books right so that's going to be interesting to talk about and then there's another article about what's going on in china right now where apparently their banks are are kind of being forced into this national service of um uh you know kind of rescuing uh the developers and other big companies in the the property sector there um, and so they're continually uh, under pressure as well. So the question I was just going to ask is, do you see any rumblings, any warning signs about kind of the global banking system or not something that's really on your radar right now? It's, 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 there's really not much there at the moment. Look, China's bailed out their stuff. We were talking about China building all these ghost towns and everything else 10 years ago. We said, hey, this is eventually going to be a huge problem. Surprise. <laughs> Here it is, right? Yeah. And, and look, they're a state-run communist economy. They'll just bail it all out if they don't. If they if they've got to buy it all, they'll just buy it all and burn it down, right? And then rebuild it again to create economic activity. Um, you know, it's a communist country; they can do that. So you know, that's you know, that's uh, and there's certainly an impact of activity, economic activity in China relative to the U.S. because we buy a lot of goods and services from them, and we export a lot of goods and services to them. And so if their economy is under a lot of pressure, then that's certainly going to affect our economy from import export trade basis. But you don't really know what their economic data is because they just make it up as they go. They don't actually report economic data like we report economic data. They just, oh, here's the number, whatever it is, there it is. And you just have to take it with a grain of salt that it has some semblance to reality, but it can be any number they want. Um, uh, again, so, you know, I they, they can report any number they want. My, my question, which, again, we can get into more detail next time, but yeah. sort of about contagion risk. And it sounds like you're not lying awake right now worrying about the bank. No, system. no, it's there's you know, we don't have the 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 structure in the banks right now that we had back in 2008. So if you're trying to come up with a 2008 corollary, that doesn't exist at the moment. Is there risk to banks? Absolutely. Could we have a financial, a financially driven credit downturn? Absolutely. There's certainly risk out there for that. There's a lot of debt, right? And so defaults on debt, those type of things certainly are an economic risk. But as soon as that happens, central banks are going to overdrive to bail that out. They are not going to let another 2008 type crisis happen. Okay. All right. Um, well, look, in wrapping up here, I just want to provide a little bit of um, sort of inside clarity into what's happening here at the new Thoughtful Money uh, venture that we've got going on here. And again, thanks everybody so much for being a part of it. It has just been amazing 
how quickly people have found this channel, how many people are watching. Um, really appreciate all your support, your viewership, and uh, continue to listen to all your questions, as well as all your kind comments that you send me about how we can continue to improve this for you. So just so you know, a few things that are going on. Um, one, I am uh, I'm suffering through, and I'm not looking for sympathy here, but just suffering through the uh, the solopreneur process of uh, everything you got to do to set up a business in the background. And uh, I just sent out a, a tweet the other day showing, you know, a skeleton on, on a on a customer care line. <laughs> you know, the guy basically being told, "Oh, your 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 issue is important to us. Our experts will be with you shortly." That's like been my life behind the scene <laughs> for the past month. Uh, but a big win is we had a, a a problem with our AdSense, which is sort of how we monetize this YouTube channel. Um, which was just taking me forever to get fixed. Um, we got that fixed, so hooray. Uh, we got a, a win on the scoreboard there. Um, I, for those that are still worrying about my my new system here, um, I do have a, a lighting and sound specialist coming in to help me upgrade things even further. And I actually just got notice while Lance and I were recording this that my upgrade to a higher degree of, uh, of high definition on Zoom uh, apparently has just been implemented. So hopefully in the videos you see coming out uh, from after this one uh, will be even clearer, which will be great. Um, I've got the new Thoughtful Money website uh, launch coming soon. That will be the website where you can go to and request a free consultation with Lance and his team at RAA or the good folks at uh, New Harbor Financial who are going to be coming on this channel the day after this interview airs with, with Lance. Uh, our friends from uh, Rocklink over in Canada are going to be uh, available through that as well. So all of that is coming soon, and I'll let you know in this program when that new website's out. Um, I will be getting a new background here. I've gotten lots of comments about the green leather. Uh, some fans, but most people saying they'd love to see something more akin to like what I had before. Uh, so uh, I will be getting that uh, up and running. That's probably not going to be happening until after the holidays, folks, just because of everything else that's going on, including the fact that I'm studying for a uh, securities licensing exam to make all this stuff uh, possible. So yeah, if you uh, weren't aware of, of how busy I was outside of the time, I'm actually on um, recording things with folks like Lance. Um, yes, I'm trying to run that part of the business because that's the part of the business that we all like and that's where all the value is, but I'm spending a ton of time with all those folks on customer care. And then when there's fictitious free minutes left over, I'm cramming for that darn uh, securities exam. So anyways, that's all the stuff that's happening behind the scenes here. Um, if you enjoy these weekly market recaps with Lance, if they are your raison d'etre, um, please uh, let us know that by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And a reminder with this channel being as new as it is, the subscriber count really does help us get the YouTube algorithm's attention. So please uh, do both uh, subscribe and like. Um, and a reminder, um, I've got um, uh, the new Substack that I set up where I'm sharing lots of information about what's going on with Thoughtful Money, including uh, the different guests that we're getting on this program in the future. Um, and if you haven't signed up for that yet, you can for free over at adamtaggart.substack.com. Um, a reminder that premium subscribers to that uh, get my Adam's notes, which summarize the key points from all these different videos. Um, the uh, Just to share some of the folks we've got coming up next week, because we continue to have just an amazing lineup. Uh, Michael Pento, uh, he'll be appearing the day after this video airs. We'll have Danielle DiMartino Booth as well next week. Um, but very excited to say I finally got a yes from uh, Felix Zuloff. Uh, and his team. And so we'll be having Felix Zuloff on this program in about a week. And I know many, many, many of you have been asking for him to come back on the program. Very happy to say that we finally got him to come back on. Um, with that being said, Lance, as always, I'm going to give you the last word here as we wrap up. Yeah, well, I'm thinking your new website set up. If you want access to our newsletter, our you know, daily market commentary, our, our, our blog on Tuesday on uh, prospecting future returns, just go to realinvestmentadvice.com. You can ask questions. I'm always happy to help you. Great. So. Realinvestmentadvice.com. And folks, um, Lance, I was I was really happy to hear that during our hiatus, right, as I was getting this whole new thing set up, I had a lot of people say how much they missed these weekly recaps, but also said, so I've gone over to Lance's YouTube channel and I've started watching his daily commentary and uh, I've been just getting lots of great feedback from folks how much they like that. So folks, in addition to going to realinvestmentadvice.com uh, and watching this video every weekend, uh, if you if you haven't gotten your fill of Lance, make sure that you go and sign up for his uh, his YouTube channel and you can enjoy Lance on the daily. 
Um, with that being said, folks, if you didn't watch the um, uh, panel replay video from the panel I moderated at the New Orleans Investment Conference, which had Lynn Alden, uh, Daniel DiMartino Booth, Jim Rickards, uh, and Russ Gray, it's a great discussion. That would be a great video to watch after this one. I'll put up a link to it right here. Lance, my friend, thanks so much for another great week. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.